I'm Ali Mallorcas. I'm the Secretary of Homeland Security. Um, Uh, Jeff, thank you very much for, for inviting me to share a few thoughts. You know, I, I want to start on a, uh, on a somber note, uh, because uh, this morning uh, I spent uh, some time uh, addressing the tragedy, uh, the natural disaster tragedy in Hawaii. Uh, approximately 55 people are already confirmed deceased, and reports are that a 1,000 uh, are missing. It, it is a fire that has uh, really destroyed uh, uh, the island of, uh, of Maui. Um, you know, last year uh, we um, had a, a, a software vulnerability uh, that enabled an individual uh, to really circumvent, to bypass our security measures and uh, communicate from our official uh, .gov uh, site, our email address. And the results of that could have been catastrophic because we communicate with people, millions of people, every single day. And very often we communicate with vulnerable communities every single day, including, for example, uh, the survivors uh, of the tragic fires in Maui. That um, consequence never materialized. Uh, the vulnerability uh, was uh, discovered uh, and addressed. And it wasn't because of anything that we in the Department of Homeland Security did. It was because of what you did. One of you, one of the more than 500 people that participated in Hack DHS, the bug, our bug bounty program, discovered the vulnerability, communicated it to us, and it allowed us to close it. You can... We, we need you. We need you to help us. Um, and I want to share a story that I thought of uh, on the way uh, out here. Um, there was a, um, a Postal Service employee and his wife, and his wife uh, worked, uh, I think she worked as a bank teller, she worked in a bank. Two people, a couple uh, of very modest means. And they lived in a very, very modest apartment in New York City. And he loved art, but they couldn't afford very much, so he would always travel through the art district. And if there was a young, struggling artist that he liked, he would, and he liked the piece, he would buy a piece, a couple hundred bucks, maybe sometimes a little bit more. And he made it a regular event with his wife. It was their weekly outing. And over the years, he gathered a lot of, of, of this art, of young aspiring artists that had not yet made it. And uh, a couple decades later, every inch of his apartment was covered with this art on the walls, it was stacked on the refrigerator, it was under the bed and the like. And ultimately, uh, in their later years, uh, they donated uh, much of their collection to the Smithsonian valued at more than $250 million. He had an eye for artists that became the dominant American artists in the post-war period. And there's a clip that I saw of him meeting with one of these artists that he liked, and he was looking at a piece of sculpture. And he, and he looked at it, and he said, you know, that's nice, but I think it would look better like this. And he turned it on its side. And as soon as, and I'm not an expert in art, but as soon as he turned it on its side in this clip, I recognized it as an iconic sculpture. The artist adopted that way of positioning his art. We, we need you, we need you to turn us on our side. Um, we, you see things that we do not see. You uh, discover things that we do not. And we really need your help. You know, we, um, we need uh, to serve people more effectively. The things we do are of tremendous consequence. 
I hope that you understand that your talent and what you can do is, uh, is and can be of tremendous consequence in not just when, 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 you, when you discover a vulnerability or what have you, or when you discover an opportunity, the, the real life consequences that that work, that discovery, that um, exercise of your ability can have, I hope that you will, you know, work with us um, and, and help us uh, in, that, in that regard. Uh, we're going to take the Hack DHS Bug Bounty pro Program and we're going to expand it uh, this year. We're going to expand it uh, to our use of AI. Um, and we need to make sure uh, that our use of AI, we want to be leaders in the responsible use of AI. We're very concerned about the security implications of generative AI and other um, uh, iterations of it. Uh, we're also very concerned, just quite frankly, about some foundational issues, some values, principles with respect to AI. We are unique in the federal government. We have a statutorily created Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, an Office of Privacy. These are two areas of tremendous uh, concern for us with respect to AI, and hopefully you'll work with us in that regard as well. Hopefully you will participate in the Hack DHS program relevant to AI and also more, more expansively. Uh, this week, uh, CISA, uh, our Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, issued a request for information on areas of investment in uh, open source uh, security. Our Cyber Safety Review Board uh, issued a, a really groundbreaking report uh, on how to uh, better secure uh, open source uh, the open source uh, ecosystem. It's of such tremendous uh, utility and promise. Uh, it here too is an opportunity for to work together. Ideally, what I'd, lo I'd love to do is I'd, lo I'd love to recruit uh, many of you to actually become members of the Department of Homeland Security. I don't know what I would call that recruitment effort, whether it would be like um, uh, hack, uh, um, hack the bureaucracy, uh, but um, but uh, yeah, yeah. By the way, by the way, one goal that I had coming in um, and behind schedule uh, is to demonstrate that government can be as nimble as any other non-governmental organization. There's no reason that we can't be. As I said, I'm a little behind schedule, uh, but in certain areas of our work, I think in the cyber domain, uh, we are. I think we are innovating in ways that are unprecedented. If you take a look at some of the, the um, innovations of the use of technology, the harnessing uh, of your talent in other domains of our work, it's, it's pretty, pretty powerful. If you're unwilling, unwilling to join us um, in our hallways, in our, in our offices. Hopefully you'll, you'll work with us, um, uh, turn us sideways, make us better, and uh, really uh, help people uh, very much uh, in need. Uh, thanks so much. I'm looking forward to a conversation with Jeff. He thinks he's going to ask me all the questions, but I may have a question or two for him. And I'm really proud to be here. Thanks. Is it on? Fast. Can you hear me? You got it. Okay. I think we're both got. We're both wired up. This is uh, Vegas style. Yeah. You're good. I don't think. Can yeah. you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Okay. All right, Jeff. So, here I am, a <laughs> government employee, sitting across from you. You started DEFCON 31 years ago. 20 years ago, if a government employee sat across from you, what would have been your message to the government employee 20 years ago, then 10 years ago, then now, on behalf of the community? 
That's a good question. I, it, the first conversation would have taken place with my lawyer present. Um, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, but since then, things uh, pretty much improved, right? You've noticed we don't have a, really a, a, it's a spot the Fed contest. Once Fed started intentionally outing each other to get the shirts, <laughs> we knew that something had changed, right? It was, we were no longer perceived as the adversary. We were, you know, and then about 10 years ago, it changed where when people from DC would come, it was, I'm gonna go see the people with green hair. And it was like a, a summer kind of like, you know, ooh, uh, sideshow. Now, you're here. You know what I mean? People, it's quantitatively changed from, uh, oh, that's interesting, summer concert, to I've gotta be there. And something's changed over the last decade. And, um, we're still doing what we're doing, but it seems like the stakes have been raised, the, maybe the value that we can contribute has increased, but something has really changed in the last 10 years. I would say, I'm not sure, well, I'll let you speak to whether the value that you uh, can provide has increased. I would say my reflex to that is the value that you can deliver is better recognized. That's, yeah. Um, I'll tell you a quick, quick story, and I'm sorry. So this is the second time I've spoken at DEF CON. The first time was when I was a deputy secretary, and it's a tradition when one speaks for the first time to take a shot. At that time, it was Jack Daniels. It was 10 in the morning, and, <laughs> and I, I said, listen, I got a lot of stuff to do. I can't, sorry, can't, no can do. And they said, you know what? We'll give you, we'll go on stage, we'll give you a shot, but it'll be water. And I said, we have a deal. So they came out. The, the subject of my speech was building trust. <laughs> so so I, took, I took the shot of water, and then I, I continued with my remarks. And then I looked out, and I said, you know, I, I, gotta, I just took a shot of water. <laughs> and here I am talking about trust and building trust, and there's, there was, more significantly, a, a, a bigger deficit. Then there remains uh, deficits understood, and it's our job to close them, and for your, hopefully for you to be open to having them closed. But and then I said, listen, bring it on. And so uh, I rode off the afternoon and had a good shot at Jack Daniels at 10. <laughs> right on. So. I was lucky, I was, you know, a little skeptical. I was in the back of the room watching, and as soon as you did that, and the audience was, woo, and it's like, okay, he's one. Like, you rooting, know. Rooting for my demise. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that goes to a very important um, aspect here on community, building community. I mean, DHS is, what, you're up to 300, how many, how big is the department now? 260,000. 260,000, and I do want to give a shout out, you might not realize this, TSA is here. TSA is at DEF CON. Right on, right here, this guy. And um, uh, when, Dave Pekoski, please stand and be recognized as an innovator. Yeah. So when we heard that TSA was coming, I'm like, do they know the fuck they're going? I mean, <laughs> like, that takes some courage. And, but TSA does a lot of cool stuff with technology. We just always hear about the screeners, but it's a big department. And it makes me think, FEMA does a lot in disasters, right? I'm sure you're on the phone all day today with FEMA in Hawaii. And there's all of these communities that DHS essentially is stitched together, and you can't function if you don't have the trust of those communities. Um, you know, CISA, building communities in the technology space. So really, if you think about it, your power, or your authority, or your, your motivation is like more of a grassroots, bottom-up, kind of community-driven. You're not necessarily top-down, intelligence community, DOD style, right? So the way you operate is different. We, um, I, I speak of our department as a department of partnerships. Uh, you know, we, our job is to make life better for people, to understand where we are falling short, and to close gaps in our own ability to deliver uh, but we, we, don't, we can't do it alone. We cannot do what we do alone, which is why, frankly, I, I have 
come to um, ask uh, for your partnership. And so, um, so with that uh, dynamic, the bottom up versus sort of the top down, isn't that sound a little different than the foundation, the founding of, of DHS after 9-11, right? I mean, do you imagine that what the department has become or had to do to adapt? I mean, it was fundamentally a counterterrorism organization or conceived that way. And now what we're talking about is not counterterrorism, right? Well, the, um, a, a few things. The threats evolve. I mean, in 20 years ago, we're in our 20th year. In 2003, when we were first stood up, people were not talking about the cyber threat vector as prominently as we are now. Uh, that's just the reality. And so we evolve as the threat landscape evolves. And frankly, we uh, build service delivery as communities' needs evolve as well. So, uh, so give me an example. What's, what's like the latest service delivery or what's a new... A new um, look, you know, I, I, the first thing that comes to mind, I don't you know what new means, but I think that adverse nation states, exploitation of the divide in this country is something I speak of as a homeland security threat. You know, the, the, the we've had our disagreements in this country for ever since its founding, of course, and they have led uh, to horrific results, born, I think, of horrific practices uh, at times. Um, the residue, in some regards, still exists. Um, the divide, the rhetoric now is so sharp, the divide is so becoming so extreme, it creates a vulnerability. That's one thing that yeah. I think of as well. Uh, but we, we, have to, we have to change the way we do things sometimes. I will tell you, there was a scathing piece um, in the Washington Post a couple years ago about uh, our provision of assistance to uh, natural disaster victims. And the criticism was warranted. You know, I, I say to colleagues, let's not shrink from criticism. Let's just work really hard not to deserve it. We deserved it. Uh, a, a black community, a very poor black community in the South was devastated. A small community was devastated by um, a hurricane, a, a tornado. And in order to receive assistance, one had to present documentation of one's home ownership, mortgage documents, deed of trust, or whatever. And this community, these poor homes, um, People had received their homes, they had been passed down from generation to generation. They didn't have the documentation. And we disenfranchised them by reason of our lack of understanding of their reality. And therefore, what we needed to do, and we did do in response to this criticism, was we changed our policy. If you don't have those documents, do you have a utility bill? Can you, can you attest to your ownership of the home? We've got to reach people where they are. Um, that's what good right. government right. is about. Yeah, and it, it, it's very refreshing to hear you say that um, because half of it is just acknowledging the problem. I mean, if you listen to my talk earlier, I'm acknowledging the problem. We screwed up on the badge manufacturing. I wish I could change it. I can't. I'm doing everything I can to improve it. We have people on airplanes flying from the warehouse, you know, the manufacturing. We're doing everything we can. Can't go back in time and fix it. But by acknowledging it and trying to be transparent, Right, that's, you, that's all you can do to help right, communicate with your community. The, you brought up a point, though, about the new attack vectors. Um, that's perfect. I have that question right there. See? Russia, invasion of Ukraine, right? information operations from China. You're finding yourself more in the countering nation state game, um, which has been traditionally viewed as more of an intelligence you know, intel I, I see function. How does the department work either with partners or Ukraine or how do you, you're domestically focused here, but to be domestically focused, you have to be outwardly focused to try to counter these foreign threats. How do? So um, I, 
have spoken about the fact, and we have spoken about the fact that <laughs> homeland security has converged with national security. Right. It is not um, the lens, the aperture is not exclusively domestic by any stretch. I know that Jen Easterly, the leader of CISA, uh, spoke earlier with uh, her counterpart from Ukraine. Um, the cooperation between the United States and Ukraine in assisting Ukraine in defending its systems against Russian attack, I think is a success story. Rob Silvers is here, our Undersecretary for Strategy, Policy and Plans, leading our international efforts, uh, along with Ann Neuberger of the National Security Council. Um, homeland security and national security have converged in this environment. And is, um, are, are there models? Um, are we sort of following a UK model? Or are we, we have our own unique model and other people are learning from us? Because it seems like we're all trying to figure this out at the same time. Is it sort of like? Um, I, I think here I would use the word partnership again, and I would just broaden it to yeah. say we, we have to work very closely with our international partners. And in the work that we do in this, in this realm, what is, the, um, what is the relevance of a physical border? Um, so then, uh, so, so then you're building these actually international communities. Yes. And so, um, which I'm, I'm really glad to see because, you know, it's a, it's kind of like a, we're fighting like a two or three pronged battle, right? You've got the hard, the physical, we're actually under ransomware attack, things are actually being, um, deleted. We're in sort of an information, hearts and minds kind of, you know, wedging communities in America against each other. Um, and then we're also in an influence game. And this is where I think the United States until recently was kind of behind where standards bodies, IETF, uh, other communities, America that helped build these, like the companies that helped build them were so successful they just kind of moved on. And that created a gap for other countries, um, China, Russia, to show up and basically co-opt a lot of these standards bodies. Um, and now I see DHS, CISA and others representing, sending officials, showing them this is the American perspective, this is the DHS perspective, this is, and it's so refreshing to see us out and engaging again. That was really missing for years. And the problem is that takes money and time. To build trust, you need some consistency. And a lot of times that, that's not present in some of our institutions. I think it's very, very difficult to build trust if one is not present. Right. One, you know, look, I, you know, um, the last time I was in the department in 2010, I shared with a colleague who was very, he was very reticent uh, to go into the community uh, and get his teeth knocked out. <laughs> and I said, look, you know what? You got to get out there. You're going to get your teeth. Sorry, I can't see you over there. Yeah. Um, uh, you got to get, go out there. You got to get your teeth bashed in, uh, and then you know what? You come back, and then at least people see that you're willing to get your teeth bashed in. You will um, maybe realize when you pick up your teeth that some of them deserve to be on the floor, others deserve to be put back, and you learn and you get better. But you got you. How do you how do you build trust if you don't engage? Right, um, and it's painful. Right, you can't always. You can't please all the people all the time, so you have to really focus on what your priorities are. It is really painful to not be trusted. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit more, right? You mentioned two things that I'm proud of, uh, of the department, um, the privacy office, Office of Civil Liberties. Maybe just talk a little bit about that, and if maybe there's a story when the privacy officer shut something down, or the Civil Liberties wrote a report that wasn't the most glowing. Like, you have these internal functions that not all other departments and agencies have. I think DHS is slightly unique in that area. Um, so, you know, the, I think what we are doing now, uh, more than ever, is our Office for Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, Shoba, who leads it, our Office for Privacy, uh, they have a seat at the leadership table. They are involved in um, all of our discussions. You know, 
We have an Office of Intelligence and Analysis that shares intel uh, with our partners around the country. Um, our uh, Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties reviews those products to make sure that they are sensitive to our principles, our values. And have they ever axed something, or is it, uh, no, things are pretty good, they, they, they're not oh, having... Uh, yeah, they're not passive. <laughs> Good. Um, because one of the things I worry about maybe is, you know, you touched on AI a little bit. And it seems like the potential for uh, abuse of, of human rights is, is greater with AI. Um, and I think the pressure on companies, on people, on governments is to use AI everywhere to become more efficient. And it seems like when the government uses AI, it's different than maybe a university uses AI. So I think the potential for harm or for potential for benefit is greater in government. And that means... Look, I mean, we're using, Jeff, we're using AI now uh, in the context of facial recognition, something that our Office for Civil Rights, Civil Liberties is taking a very This is uh, the TSA when you're, when you're boarding a plane or you're screening? Well, uh, or? So, yeah, yeah, well there I think we, um, we're explaining what we do and what we don't do, but in other arenas as well, you know, uh, there are significant concerns with uh, facial recogni recognition's ability uh, to uh, discern uh, uh, di uh, individuals uh, with different colored skin, different tones, a um, especially uh, concerned about youth, um, and, and like, and these are challenges that we have to tackle, we have to confront and work through it. Do you see we'll be sort of an AI oversight board, or is that just going to be merged in with the civil liberties and the privacy, or does this constitute a, a new thing? Or will you task every one of your departments and agencies and say, you need to have an AI report, or you need to have a, you know? Uh, so I, 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 I think w one of the things that um, we are looking at, and I, I don't want to get too far ahead, is, you know, to have a, like a safety, a safety review board, just like um, our cyber a safety review board that is now issued, you know, um, very significant reports. Uh, the first one with Log4j, uh, the second one uh, uh, with Lapsus, and now we, we, we just announced, um, you know, lessons to be learned uh, with respect to um, uh, uh, identification, you know, identity authentication. Uh, in the cloud-based environment, so that we just announced that. I think there's just a lot of a lot of things. And by the way, what's what distinguishes that board, in addition to just its groundbreaking work, it it, it is um, security researchers, talent. Your talent is involved in the analysis of incidents and in the recommendations that are made. It is a board that is not about accountability, it is not about blame, it is about learning and strengthening. It's sort of that, uh, what's the, the, the near miss, the, the pilot uh, FAA one, where if you, if you make the contribution and point out the problem, you're basically insulated from liability. But if you don't reveal the problem and it blows up in your face, now you're in trouble, right? You want to incentivize this collaborative environment where people aren't pointing fingers yes. at each other. Yeah, we're, it's, it's all about um, identifying, uh, well, understanding the treasure, the open source environment, uh, understanding how to make it more secure and the like, and Rob is, is the chair of the board. Yeah, so the and and uh, Heather Atkins from Google is the vice chair. It's a public-private partnership, and we use uh, security researchers to really drive the best results. So on that open source question, um, this is a hobby horse of mine, is to beat up companies that they take a lot from open source in the sense that they build products, they innovate a lot, but they don't upstream their code changes, they don't fund the communities of which they get their software. Um, and the one I like to point out that does a really good job of this is Netflix. Netflix makes tons of changes um, on the networking for FreeBSD. And every change they make ends up, they fund code optimization. And FreeBSD, the operating system, is way better because of Netflix. And Netflix is way better because of this relationship. That's a very positive 
uh, ecosystem. Yeah, ecosystem, give and take, but that's rare. That doesn't really happen much. In, and so it almost feels like um, a tragedy of the commons kind of social dilemma problem where um, the, the, the backs on which we're built, all this is built, they're not getting kind of rewarded. And in tragedy of the common problems or, or social dilemma problems, a lot of times the solution is government. Right? Government does not exist in a purely commercial function. They're filling the gaps for what the needs of society are, which are maybe not commercial needs. And so I'm really excited here when you talk about open source, are there ways we can support open source, fund open source, identify critical pieces of open source? It's like anything that makes open source more healthy, you're raising the boats for everybody in the planet, not just, you know, a state. So, uh, I mean, I know that we have reached out with respect to um, how you can help us secure uh, that environment. Um, Jeff, if there are other ways in which, you know, other aspects as to which we should reach out, yeah. uh, then l let's, let's talk about that and let's yeah. do that. Yeah, I think one of the things, I think FEMA would have grants. Um, I've been talking uh, with Director Easterly, you know, are there ways you could identify and do a summer of code, or a grant to improve the security feature that we all need, but there's no, the, the company's not interested in adding it. You know, are there kind of commonalities where we can help improve the system? But I don't know the grant process. I don't know how, you know, I don't know how that part of government works. But I do know if something like that doesn't happen, if it's not philanthropic or government, or, you know, it's probably not going to happen. So we, um, so a couple of thoughts. One, we have a cybersecurity grant program. Um, two, uh, our grant process um, is not a model of simplicity. Um, uh, it is something that we are working on. Uh, I tasked a, a private sector advisory council to make recommendations. Um, maybe we need to take a look at um, how we can deliver grants to non-traditional um, recipients, uh, and maybe mm -hmm. and maybe that'll help build build the partnership um, that I request as well. Yeah, I know. I think one of the things uh, DHS maybe, maybe we have to step out of the orthodox on that in terms of um, grant recipients and. Um uh, I want to touch briefly on some of your comments a little bit uh, developing the, the talent pool, the workforce, right? How is DHS going to onboard these people? And it's f fascinating to hear years ago I was on a task force at DHS on uh, developing the cyber skills task force. And to see those recommendations kick in and things to change, how would you see, you know, you're calling for people to come to DHS. How has it changed in your perspective, you know, onboarding, offboarding? The idea that maybe people don't under enter government service for their career, maybe now they're entering for a period of time and coming in and out of private sector. Like the way people work seems to have changed. Uh, abs so, so absolutely. And it doesn't, it doesn't need to be a commitment, you know, in perpetuity. You'll, you'll decide the duration uh, uh, that you would want to stay. We, will, we would love your talent to bring in your talent for whatever period of time uh, you'd be willing to do that. You know, we have um, we have models where it's actually um, uh, we we almost like borrow um, your time, your your talent for a short period of time, for six months uh, or, or so. I will tell you, um, and Jen and I have talked about this. I have a I have a mixed feeling about our um, some one aspect of our recruitment of of cyber talent, um, it's tough to recruit because in the private sector, the, 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 uh, we can't compete from a financial perspective, and uh, we have been able to kick up um, the income of incoming cyber talent, and I've got very mixed feelings about that. Because I have to tell you, you don't come to the government for the money. And there are people that have dedicated their lives to public service, and the reward, the reward is um, a more fundamental reward than the than financial. And I know that a, the vast majority of you, if not all of you, 
I don't know your community well enough to, to say, but the, the reward that you seek is it, you're not, you don't do what you do for, for money. You do, you do it for its consequential nature, what it means, what it means to you. What so it means to you. Well, so you're talking, all right, the sense of mission. A sense of mission. Right. A sense of, I would say, a sense of purpose. And, um, and so I think civil society can provide that, government can provide that, um, our communities, right, we provide that for each other. Um, and so once you recognize that, you, you, need to, you need to have a really clearly defined sense of mission. You need to be able to not have one part of your department destroy the sense of mission from another department, right? It gets very... Um, and in the social media age, you've, you need to be nimble and be able to respond. So I, I was going to say, um, how fun is it for you then? Um, eight years ago or so, as an S2, now you're there S1, or you go from... How do you make that transition and how does it go, I guess... I guess what I'm getting at is, like, is, what excites you, right? Fun wouldn't be the first word that comes to mind. <laughs> right. right, so it's the sense of mission that's the motivator. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. But my greatest source of pride is the people with whom I get to work and the purpose that we all share. That is my greatest source of pride. I, I have to tell you, um, uh, you know, I... Uh, we came to this country in 1960 as refugees, political refugees, um, uh, escaping uh, the communist takeover of Cuba. Uh, it was the second time in my mother's life that she was a refugee. I have, a, a, I grew up with a profound sense of gratitude with respect to what this country was able to give to my family and me, and uh, that's what led me in 1989 to join the government as a career uh, employee. And that was, was, you had become a lawyer by then, or this was I was, a, I was a lawyer at that time. And so that, that perspective, the legal perspective, your, your background, um, I think that helps you connect, uh, you think, with people in these communities, because you understand uh, what it is to maybe be in their shoes. That empathy, that... Uh, we don't see in a whole lot of leadership in companies, right, where it's a lot about bravado. Um, can, can I... Yeah. How do you leave that can, behind? Can, can I... Uh, let me... Can I share a, a quick story? Yeah, please. Uh, because you say um, uh, being in people's shoes. I, I, I have to share this, even though it's... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand so I can see. Sure, sure. It's too personal for me. So I grew up in a home where my parents really um, um, made sure that my sister and me understood what it, mean to be, uh, what it means to be displaced. Um, um, my father um, uh, left the country of his birth. He did not get a chance to... Um, uh, be by his mother's side when she passed. He had to. He had to take us out. And I uh, and I grew up with a really profound understanding of what it means to be a refugee, a political refugee. Then, in 2000, I think it was 2011. I was at. I was a director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. We, we administer the legal immigration system, and we have our refugee affairs officers who travel around the world and interview people to determine their eligibility to come to the United States as refugees. And I visited the refugee camp in Dadaab on the Kenyan-Somali border. We traveled by a, a small jump plane from Nairobi to this camp. And the entire flight, all you see is sand. All you see is sand. And these individuals had traveled from Somalia to this camp, hundreds of miles. I don't know how they made it. And the camp was designed for 90,000 people, and at the time I visited, there were 300,000. And these are people who were sleeping on the sand, 
and they were covered by either plastic or paper bags. And I said, there's nothing. And they ship food in. They ship food in twice a week. And um, I sat in on an interview of a family, parents, father and mother, and four children. And the, our refugee affairs officer spoke first to the eldest of the children, 17-year-old young woman, and asked her where she had been born. And she looked down, and then she looked at my colleague, like puzzled, and said, uh, I, was, I was born here. She had known nothing else but this camp. And you cannot describe these individuals as poor, because poor suggests you have, in my mind, you have something, you just don't have enough. They have nothing. And I left there, um, first of all, thinking the world is not civilized. And second of all, I couldn't call myself a refugee. She's a refugee. This family, they're refugees. We, we, came, we, came with, with, we came with things. And my father, uh, uh, though he struggled for a period, um, was on his feet. Um, and I've carried that with me because I've, I've never been in their shoes. I've carried that with me. It's, it's just not an opportunity. It's not an opportunity. It's a responsibility of government to address that. And, you know, whenever we uh, issue a policy, whether it's in cybersecurity or anything, that says something about not only who we are, but who we want to be. And there are many policies of which I'm incredibly proud, and there are many that I, of which I am not. And it's sometimes a struggle. It's always a privilege. And, you know, making a difference, sometimes a small difference, sometimes a really big difference, is really um, why you, you find that that's why a lot of the people are in government to make, uh, to make a difference. It's all about people. You make a huge difference in what you do. You can make such a big difference in helping us, helping us be proud of everything that we do and closing the gap in, in our sense of our own pride. And I, I really, I just, if I have one message to all of you is, you know, quite frankly, I mean, I do care. I was about to say I don't care if you trust us or not. I do care really deeply. You know, maybe uh, you have to wait till we've built, you know, built your trust. Maybe you're willing to give it to us and see if we keep it. Whatever it is, um, the, you know that far better than I. I'm not expert. In, in your work. I, I recognize your talent. Um, you see things that can, that you see things, you find problems, you know how to fix them. Uh, that can really make a difference in people's lives. And I, I know that that is why you do what you, you do. You also, of course, have to support yourselves. So it's not hack DHS for nothing. It's a hack DHS bug bounty program. We, we all have to make a living. Uh, but there's a sense of purpose in this room, and we, I want to just communicate that we share a purpose. <laughs> okay, Ali, we can't beat that. I don't have a topper question. That was, um, that was incredible. And uh, I really want to thank you for coming out here and, and, uh, and, and talking with us. And, uh, and I'm, I'm really proud of what the department's been doing, and that's largely in part to you. So thank you for coming out and talking with our community. Thank you all very much. Thank yeah. you, Jeff. Thank you.